The Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Welcome to it. Back with you, weekend edition. Tale of our city radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, Elijah Herbal is driving it. Welcome in. We are two weeks from today. Kickoff, big noon kickoff, Nebraska, Ohio State. A lot to get into. A pretty eventful week with media appearances via Zoom for uh, Nebraska's quarterbacks and Adrian Martinez and Luke McCaffrey. Super Mario made an appearance, which is pretty awesome. Coach Lubick. And uh, plenty to get into. Can join us this morning if you're bumping around the capital city. Can stream us ESPNLincoln.com. Numbers to dial up 466 37 76 466 37 76 800 825 5865. Email Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Mark at HaleVarsity.com. And get a hold of us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio at Mark Skurs at Herbal essence on twitter for elijah cranach brother it's good to chat with you it's been a year or or two it feels like man you no know, it has been a little while it's it's good to be back with you as well sir you, you're doing all right we, we good we're, we're hanging in and um yeah and uh elijah did just awesome work uh sitting in for me uh and uh cranach really appreciate you and the outreach. Uh, Dad passed away on the thirtieth of uh, of September, and I uh, just think and smile about him a ton, man. Especially this time of year with college football season. And for sure, two weeks ago we were watching the Pirate uh, do his thing against uh, LSU. We were watching K State do the comeback against Oklahoma, and w- we almost got the trifecta with uh, Texas and Texas Tech pillow fighting. You know, defense is optional. <laughs> so, yeah. but no, it's it's just been a whirlwind here last few days, and I uh, care about both of you guys so much. And Grant Anchor was awesome to, to see you Monday. I appreciate you and yeah, love you, brother. Well, and thinking about you and love you and praying for you and all that, man. You're a great guy. It's great to have you back. And um, let's do this, right? Yeah, no. Let's, let's and so I appreciate you and, and, and your family. Well, same back to you, Cowboy. Uh, we got a lot to get into with Nebraska and – so many topics to discuss. And the, the thing is this, you've seen some videos that have been put out by, by Nebraska football. Uh, you have heard from Coach Frost, either with his radio show or via Zoom. And Nebraska has, the, the vibe I have, and I don't think it's lost on many folks either, Nebraska's got quite a bit of quiet confidence i think about them this year but more so it's it's a workmanlike attitude where they are just grinding to let their actions do a lot of talking and in in previous seasons there has been some some chirping by nebraska about um just where they are and, and where their standing is in the Big Ten. And I don't I, – I, I have thought about that a lot, and it, it doesn't dominate my thoughts, but I'm I'm interested – you know, because right now you're kind of getting the opposite heading into year three. There's just not a lot of bravado. Not to say that Nebraska isn't confident, but from a verbal standpoint, the head's been it's down. Muted. Yeah, the head's been down and nose has been to said grindstone. I wonder – uh, if we go back, you know, last season with some of the hype and the and the back slaps because of how 2018 finished, and then you know Scott Frost is here and the announcement of you know uh, his press conference with you know hope the Big Big Ten's got to adjust to us. I'm paraphrasing. I, I wonder if if Frost purposefully the last couple of years has has said some things. Not that he's not confident and not that he's not an uber competitor. I think he, he thinks that they can go out and, and play hard and win at every game. I mean, I think he has that level of optimism uh, just because of, of his personality. But 
put the put the microscope on me versus all right, I don't know how good my teams are going to be. Let me get the mm-hmm. the arrows, let me get the pressure, let me be the yeah. center of discussion versus bro, the 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 D lines hit or miss or what's going on with the linebackers or Who's at wide receiver? Do you have someone to step in for Stanley? I mean, all those things. This year, uh, you, you just kind of have some matter-of-fact comments. Uh, we're, we're thinking about who's going to step up at outside linebacker. We're thinking about what happens in the quarterback room uh, with uh, this competition. We're also interested in, in you know what, what level of contribution can a guy that we've anointed uh, – in Omar Manning make what what's what's realistic about his role and and how he's doing right now with football and all those those things are are major puzzle pieces as two weeks from today at 11 o'clock it's it's Ohio State time it's giddy up time man so there's there's a ton to to unpack there but level of of or areas of, of like just blind optimism for you, the Nebraska fan, there's not been a lot you've seen because of COVID, right? There's a lot of folks that are close to the program that have not seen practices because of COVID, okay? Uh, and that's just the truth. No one's really allowed in. It's just that group in the Hawk Center or at Memorial Stadium busting their butt every day to, to have a good 2020. There's some areas that you're still waiting to come around. There's some wait and see reality with this football team in 2020. And then there's just flat out areas of concern because you haven't seen it to kind of piggyback off of that wait and see. So those are three different doors we can try and open. If I'm going to pick a spot where I have just blind optimism and I'm going to say, look, I know the coach at that position group is is really good. I know that there's a, a ton of career starts. I'm going to go offensive line, probably really obvious, but I would go offensive line where I know you're making a move with uh, Farniak. I know you're looking at a guy in, in Ben Hart at right tackle that's really young but really talented. And Greg Austin's comfortable with who he's got, comfortable enough to probably kind of throw out a bit of a depth chart when he did his Zoom meeting. And right behind that, I feel really good about Mills. And not too far behind that, I feel good about quarterback in a bounce-back type situation for Adrian. So there's kind of my blind optimism pecking order, one, two, three. Uh, and and secondary is probably in there as well. Is there a region or area, Cranach, that you're kind of uh, – you haven't seen a lot, but you feel good that it'll be better and be a strength this year? I think, you know, and then the, it's, I like the way you're putting it, too, where it's what, what are the areas that you feel confident that will be competent? Right. You know, it doesn't mean like when you say offensive line, I don't think you're saying that it's going to be, you know, the Aikman Cowboys or anything. Right. It's, or 94 it's, Nebraska. Right. It, but it means that they're going to hold their own. They're going to be all right. They're going to be above average in the league. I feel confident in saying that about the offensive line for sure. Um, and I, a close second for me is also uh, Dedrick Mills because you're settled at running back for the first time. God, you have to go back to what Abdullah. Even when yeah. Newby, even when Newby took over the reins from Abdullah back in 2015, I'm not sure many of us were that confident that he was definitely for sure the guy at that position. We were waiting and on him to do well inside the tackles, running the football. Totally. And you didn't necessarily know that it was his job, right? There was, there was a battle there. Um, now, you know, for sure it is Mills and like that alone matters right behind Martinez. It's not, you're not messing with Maurice Washington. Who's kind of in and out. You're not sort of trying to break into Zigbo and hoping that maybe he rises after getting himself in different shape. I mean, it's been an unsettled position ever since Abdullah left. It just hasn't been, Locked down. It finally is. But number one for me, I feel like a broken record (laughs) because I've been saying this, I think, since uh, Frost decided to come back uh, to Lincoln. It's the secondary for me. Okay. Uh, Because it's it's not just Travis Fisher. That's part of it. Um, And I you hope that it does translate from what 
I saw with UCF 2017 to Nebraska 2020, it just it it, it had barely ever I I had hardly ever experienced watching a game and then a position group jumps out so much to where you're just like who the what hold on <laughs> and it made me want to like research <laughs> who the coach is and who these players are when when you watched the bowl game of Auburn and UCF and in, in I guess the year would have been 2018 mm-hmm. but it was 2017 season I, I could not believe just just how much of an impact that secondary made on the entire team they were great you, yeah, you're right. You had Griffin, and he's absolutely a difference maker. You had sort of an unheralded but very effective, de- effective defensive line. I mean, it was a team defense, mm-hmm. no question. But the secondary was – I mean, they really made Auburn receivers pay. They they destroyed blocks. They blew up screen passes. They came up and supported in the run game. I mean, that was just a very physical, tone-setting secondary. And I think you've seen flashes of that flashes, but I think you had some personnel over the past couple of years, talented as they are, not necessarily physical. In fact, not physical at all. I don't want to say not necessarily, just not physical, but because of their talent level, you, you kind of had to play them. And look, there's a place for those people. There's a place for that kind of player. It's fine <laughs> playing in the NFL now. So like, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But when when all you, when your only choices left in the secondary are people that will light you up, I, I mean I think that's what Nebraska is dealing with in the secondary right now. I think you're dealing. I think Deontay Williams is a head hunter. I think Dismukes a head hunter. I think Boodle's a head hunter. I think Britt's a head hunter. <laughs> I mean, right? And then and then there's some young bucks from from all accounts that you haven't seen a lot of that are the exact same way. And if that's all you have. If those are your only choices in the secondary are guys that are going to bring the wood, guys that are going to hit, guys that are not scared, and guys that have physical talent and speed, which are you, all those names I just named, they have that, right? And then they also have some experience. I mean, Deontay Williams is like 48 years old. <laughs> I, I right? can't wait to watch him go ball hawk if he stays right? healthy. Just, yeah, so yeah, he's not only that. So it's not. So I think... And again, this is us coming from an optimistic point of view. Yeah. Okay. This is what what are we optimistic about? I am optimistic that the secondary is not going to be a liability. And in fact, could be a plus on your defense and on your team just because of the makeup of those guys. And that's the that's the thing about the entire team coming into this year. Look, Fr- Frost has been he's been prioritizing the, the self-starter types on the recruiting trail for several years now, for three years. You're, you're, so to, to compare it to past staffs, you know, Abdullah was a self-starter. Janovich, Riley, Stanley Morgan, Malik Collins. I mean, you can go down the list. Players that you don't need to tell to work out. Players that you don't need to tell to show up to practice and, and bring it. Right? They're just, they're just wired like that. And I think for a number of years, recently especially, I think you had some of those guys, but I don't think it was the rule on the team. I think you had a lot of exceptions to that. And I think that screwed Nebraska up, right? Because you had these guys that you had to like stay on or maybe they were talented, but their head wasn't right and they didn't give it their all or, you know, they let their bodies kind of fall apart and there wasn't accountability there. I think those days are completely over. And I think more and more, the majority of the team is that type. That And by the way, Frost is that type. Barrett Rood's that type. Greg Austin's that type. Travis Fisher's that type. Like much of the coaching staff, that they don't even understand players that don't have that mentality. They don't even know how to relate with them. Right? Like they just, they just, they just don't even, like, what, how, why do we have to be on you about that? Like, your division one, come on. Like, they, they don't want to spend any of their time doing that. And I, I just think you have more. I, I think the, the, the as time goes on, you are going to end up with, and they're getting there, where your entire team is just that. It's just a bunch of dudes that don't need to be told to get after it. And they're just going to get after it. And, and if you have enough of those guys, you're not blinking at this schedule. 
<laughs> you're not blinking at starting with Ohio State. What was that? Uh, no, I'm I'm saying that you you have illustrated part of that culture topic, right? That that mm-hmm. has been referenced and has been hit on by the head coach and that's the first corner to turn right now it comes to translation on field right there there, there needs to be some wins there needs to be more close fourth quarter wins because that's that's the name of the big 10 unless you're ohio state and penn state even in some instances with penn state or ohio state there's two or three ball games a year and one of them's kind of a sneak up game. It could be a road show at Purdue. It could be trying to hang on against Northwestern. God love them, right? Or you know, does, does Sparty decide to give it hell one Saturday? I mean, you you got to <laughs> you got to be living right and you got to be deep and you have to be developed and you really need to to find a way to be better and execute and take care of the football and all those things that don't sound real sexy, but are going to be the difference in a 500 division record or a game above 500 division record, or what's your record in one score, one possession games? I'd like to jump in here with uh, with your optimism. Yeah, and I'm going to piggyback on Mark on the second year. I'm not sure what I can say that he didn't already say, mm-hmm. um, besides the fact that there's going to be injuries as the season goes on, I think the secondary is the deepest group as well. Mm-hmm. You have a guy like Cam Taylor yep. Britt who's going to be backed up by Nabab Joseph. You got Quentin Newsom, we've heard good things about. Uh, you got Miles Farmer, Noah Pola Gates, all these guys who can come up and step in and, and fill a role uh, in case there is an injury because playing an eight game conference schedule, uh, there's going to be injuries. And from what we've heard, as Mark said, all these guys love to hit. And we haven't had a secondary like that since the Bo Pelini years, I'd argue. It's but been the, a while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It has been a while. And. Yeah, you're not going to have to tell those. You're not going to have to hope they turn into a physical player or something. Like that. Nebraska is going to trot out on the field with a fast and physical secondary. We can say that. I can say that with 100% confidence. Does that mean they beat Ohio State or Penn State? No. But it gives them a fighting chance <laughs> because if you don't roll out with that, you have no chance. So you're, al- right. you're already hinting at taking the points. <laughs> I'm just saying. And then, you know what? Surprisingly, I, look, optimism again. It is, this isn't certainty. I am optimistic that special teams will be. Ah, a, I, I was going to say why. that. <laughs> here's why. Here's why. Optimistic. I didn't say I'm certain. I said I'm optimistic. It can't get worse. Sure. It cannot get worse. It's way to go. <laughs> I mean, oh. seriously. Like, how many kickers did Nebraska have last year? Seven? I don't know, man. Hundred? What? I, I, Walk I, on I don't know. I don't know. Turning right. into kicker? Like, I mean, come on! It was brutal last year. I mean, brutal. I, collectively, that had to have been the worst special teams outfit in America. Like collectively, had to, right? Just you aren't gonna horrible. find you aren't gonna find a team in college football. That was worse with momentum swinging oh. special teams gaffes. Oh, that that Look. that absolutely changed the script of a football game, and what happened? It, oh. it ended up being a, an energy zapper, and we're thinking Wisconsin, right? For sure, Iowa, Iowa, for sure. I mean, look at Thursday night for the NFL. You get a kickoff return. After you're up 13 rip if you're Tampa, and it's it's a kickoff guy that takes it from a nine yards deep that brings it out to midfield for Chicago. Cordero Patterson, Patterson, oh. it just it just circles at the highest level what special teams is. We talk about three phases. Let's be straight. We focus on offense and defense, but there's your decider is you got to win two of the three phases. Like, and you have to. I mean, at this level. You, you, a forty-yard field goal, you pretty, you have to be like ninety-five percent confident that thing's going through the uprights. That should be automatic. Yeah, you couldn't. Frosthead did not have that last year. No, and you're all, you already have an offense that it, in the red zone is already going to be. It's it's kind of tough, right? Just because of the style of offense. Like if you look across the board, a lot of the style, a lot of the teams that run this style of offense, they're not great in the red zone. They're just not. They score because off they, big plays. 
Right. They score on big plays. They 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 spread the field vertically and horizontally. Like they need that space mm-hmm. in order for the the offense to really come to life. And then as soon as that gets compressed, you know, it's just it's just harder. Um, especially for these styles. So you have to be able to count on getting those chip shot fuel. You couldn't count on that. You also couldn't count on, think about this. Why did Wisconsin and Iowa, why were they able to return um, kicks for touchdowns? Because Nebraska didn't have a kicker that could kick touchbacks. They couldn't, like just imagine if you had a guy. Start from the 25, do it now. Who just punts it, who just crushes it through the uprights. On a kickoff, and then there's no return at all. So I'm, I'm not even talking about like kickoff return coverage. <laughs> I, I those the the kickoff return coverage unit had to cover more kicks than probably any team in America. Of course, they were going to give up a couple. <laughs> I don't know. I I just so I have a lot of optimism that it's it will not be worse than that. It just, I mean, no way. I mean, you were seriously pulling in kickers. That were like walk-on safeties. Like, hey, didn't you kick in junior high? <laughs> we all did. Some of us were better than others. Hey, didn't you play soccer? No, I didn't. I forgot even the best one. Remember the kid? I don't, I forget his name already. I'm sorry, but remember the kid who was a he's like a club soccer player. Yeah, well, he's the dude who drilled the the, the winner against Northwestern, didn't he? I know. And like, bless his heart, bless his heart. Like so cool, like such a cool story. But I don't want that story. Right? I just want a dude with a thunder leg that I don't, you know, that is just that just kicks the ball through. The, like, that's just a competent kicker, not some, not a guy that's been playing soccer on the club team. <laughs> that, you're so desperate, you have to like put out a casting call across campus. Take Note out an to self in 2020, Cranach does not want feature story on the guy that used to sell live bait that's now a holder. No, we don't need that. <laughs> you don't need that. So I have optimism. You got this You got this punter from Australia now, Daniel Cherney. Or Cherney's, Cherney. Cherney's money. Right? And he's, yeah, that guy's, he's a beast. And everybody that's gone through the development program in Australia that he just went through. Like, I mean, those guys are just the ones that keep winning Luke Rosas and keep going to the NFL. So, I don't know. I feel better about it. I don't know how we could feel worse. I like Culp, too. Connor Culp, uh, LSU. Yeah. Guy won Brian the transfer, right? Yeah. Guy won the job as a freshman and got beat out because LSU's done pretty good things with the, their field goal kicking the last several years. So, so when, when we say all this... I know we can get into them more later, but there are, there are two areas that just jump out as areas of concern for me. Mm-hmm. Two main position receiver. I think you have some people there. I think you have some talent. I think you have some speed. I think you have like two combined catches ever on the college level. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you know we don't have a lot of experience there. And so, yeah, like yeah, I know Omar Manning's the man, but now he's going against an NFL secondary week one. Mm-hmm. Same with Marcus Fleming. Same with Xavier Betts. Same with Levi Falk. Right? Monte like, Brown. I mean, what do you what do you get? We'll we'll dive into you got talent. Yeah, we'll dive into the wideouts. We'll hit D line and, and linebacker. Linebacker. O- no. Outside linebacker is man. That was item number one for for Coach Frost uh, when he talked uh, this week. And uh, again, you've got some bodies, and I think. You know, everywhere Dawson's been, and he was just with the Giants, their outside backers did really well. We're talking career high in sacks and pressures, and he wasn't necessarily working with a bunch of Von Miller-type dudes, right? I mean, he's working with NFL players, but so I don't doubt when we get back to optimism about his ability to, to coach and teach, but you're, you're, you're just waiting on some guys – Specifically, a Caleb Tanner that uh, has the skill set, right? Can can he get uh, unleashed off the edge? Do you get yeah. uh, a, a? And we know that JoJo is super talented and very effective in this defense. And you've seen him make plays. Can he get a little bit more discipline? And he'd be the first to tell you that 
that was uh, that was that was an issue from time to time because he wanted to to go make that splash play, and you also got to follow through with your responsibility on on contain. So uh, a lot more to get into. Weekend edition of Hale Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, Elijah Herbal producing. Uh, we'll do a rewind. Great stuff. Some. Pretty good insight on Nebraska and Ohio State as things get kicked off in two weeks. Uh, College Game Day's Brad Edwards next. That's our Rewind. Hail Varsity continues. We're presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Now back with Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery with Chris Schmidt and Mark Cranach. We welcome in... Brad Edwards, college football insider with ESPN, College Game Day at J. Brad Edwards on Twitter is where you find him. Brad, great to talk to you again. We're uh, getting geared up for another big weekend of college football. How you doing? Oh, I'm I'm doing okay. And uh, yeah, the uh, the Eddie Van Halen thing was uh, was big yesterday for anyone who uh, who grew up in the in the '80s. Um, I, I mean, it's it's hard to imagine anyone who tried to uh, to play guitar in the uh, in the eighties or, or even the early nineties, who wasn't in some way influenced by him, and uh, and and also just kind of in awe of what he was able to do. So, um, yeah, that was one. I had to introduce my daughter uh, to him last night on YouTube, and uh, she had her her jaw open uh, or dropped, you know, as as she was watching. First of all, I was amazed at what he could do on the guitar second was amazed that he would play that long, you know, cause kids today mm. are not used to songs lasting much more than three and a half minutes. Sure. So uh, the fact that the fact that he could have the attention span to play guitar for that long is impressive to her. Did you, uh, did you have a, a I'm going to learn guitar and, and, and be like Eddie phase. No, I, I didn't. Um, in fact, I was in college before I even attempted to, uh, to try to learn how to play guitar. And even then it was only <laughs> acoustic. I was never really, interested in electric, uh, sure. but, uh, but yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I messed around with it enough that I can watch those videos and look at his fingers and just, I, I can't comprehend how someone can do that. That's pretty cool. Now he was, he was a good time, man. And makes me smile. Thinking of, uh, all the fun I had listening to Van Halen. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, yeah. You, I, you, let me, let me say this. Uh-huh. I, I am, I would assume I'm in the minority. I'm not sure how big, uh, of a minority it is of people who actually liked Van Halen better with Sammy Hagar than with David Lee Roth. Uh, I know well, I'm a diamond Dave guy. Okay. <laughs> see, yeah, see, I, I, I was, I was never crazy about, I liked some of their songs, but I, I was not crazy about uh, David Lee Roth. Well, and, and I was talking to Elijah here, Elijah's younger than I am. And, the way he was introduced to Hot for the Teacher was the Varsity Blues scene, where it's the English teacher on stage. Oh. <laughs> yeah, different generation, uh-huh. right? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah no I kidding. mean, they get there's so many, so many covers of these songs now. That I, I'm, I'm really amazed, my kids, how many like '80s songs they know, and most of them they know because of because of covers or because of movies that these songs have ended up in. Yeah. And, uh, and and so a lot of times I'll, I'll reference a song and I'm like, I know you don't know this because you're too young. And then they know the song. And I'm like, how have you ever heard this song before? But that's how. Yeah. Uh, the first time I heard of David Lee Roth actually uh, was that stupid Adam Sandler Hanukkah song. Okay. And it's okay. like David Lee yeah. Roth likes yeah. the menorah. And I was yeah. like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> so yeah. let me Google. The, uh, no, David Lee Roth was, was the 80s brother. Uh, he was, he was crazy. Yeah. Let's get into some football. And this was fun to talk music for a little bit. I want to get your thoughts on, uh, well, Nebraska's gearing up here a couple of weeks yet till uh, Ohio State with uh, the big red heading to Columbus. And all those cutouts in, in Buckeye Stadium, uh, you know, we're we're pretty intrigued about some of the young guys with the defensive line for Nebraska. Uh, also, the quarterback spot is is deeper, but offensive lines also a, a you know a position of strength we think for Nebraska. But Brad, you've seen a lot of wide receivers uh, around the country, and you've seen a lot of places kind of jumpstart offenses in their program. Uh, and, and I think of programs that may have been dormant or, or struggling with consistency, find success. And I think of Nick Saban and, and Julio Jones, right? That was his first big get yeah, when he yeah. got to Bama. 
But just spend a second here on on what you think uh, a, a enhanced wide receiver room can do. Where you, you have dudes and playmakers and, and athletes in those skill spots, how it can really stress different defenses in the Big Ten. Well, that's where I think it starts in today's college football is with the passing game. I, I think you'd have to be hiding under a rock to not recognize that we've gotten to a point where today, as, mu- as much as us old-timers love to say defense <laughs> wins championships, and I'm not saying defense isn't important even when you get to a national championship game, but I think we've now gotten to the point where the very best defenses in the country cannot keep up with the very best offenses. And, you know, e- even – games like that. Well, look, last year, Clemson was arguably the best defense in the country. If it wasn't them, it was probably uh, Georgia. Sure. And those two teams both played LSU late in the season, and LSU wiped the field with both of them. So, I mean, that. and look, every, every year there's not a Joe Burrow, but offenses just keep getting better and better overall. And, and, and on the offensive side, it has shifted from being able to run the ball to being able to throw the ball that makes an offense much more dangerous. And as much as as we look at offensive lines and we want to see these big guys just pancake people and open up holes big enough to drive a truck through, the truth is what adds the most value to an offense is for an offensive line to be able to give the quarterback plenty of time to throw. I mean, as long as you've got a quarterback good enough and receivers good enough, you are going to do a lot more damage by having time to throw than you are by opening up holes to run through. And that's just the facts, you know, that you can, you can get 75 yards a lot faster on a pass than, than you can running the ball. And I don't just mean by the stopwatch. I mean, you're going to, if you look at the number of, of explosive plays in college football, way more of them are going to come from pass plays than they are from run plays. And so uh, that's a long way of just getting to the point that I, I think that if you're going to be, elite and especially offensively elite in college football today, you need a really good quarterback and you need playmakers that he can throw the ball to. And, uh, and so if, if I were, you know, kind of in a general manager role or, or given a a job of head coach and told to build a program, um, I'm going to start with the quarterback, obviously. And then the next thing I'm going to look for are receivers. Mm -hmm. And then, by the way, the next thing I'm going to look for after that are DBs who can cover those receivers. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And there's a lot of hype and um, there's a lot of uh, excitement for the, the, the group that Nebraska has coming in at wide receiver. Of course, Wandale Robinson uh, had a really good freshman year, but he's, got, he, he's going to have some help with him. It sounds like uh, splitting out for, for Adrian uh, to throw the ball to or or whoever, but Scott Frost really loaded up on the receiver room. Omar Manning's a name that man the world wanted. He ended up going to JUCO, left uh, TCU, and we're excited to see him do some things uh, in 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 red uh, for Nebraska home and away. Uh, I thought, yeah. Now, Chris, here, here's the downside. By the way, yes. the downside to opening up with Ohio State, just based on what I've seen over the first, I those, don't know what it is, five weeks. Those now defensive season, backs. <laughs> well, no. The downside of opening up with Ohio State is that the teams that we expected to be the best, uh, along with Ohio State, Clemson, and Alabama, mm-hmm. offensively, have started the season exactly where they left off last year. You know, that, that uh, we've seen other teams that have kind of struggled out of the gate, but the ones that had a, a quarterback who had some experience and, you know, have explosive receivers, and you just kind of knew their pass game was going to be tough to stop, those have all been, you know, everything that you expect them to be, like right out of the gate. And so that's the concern. As much as you might look at, a, okay, Georgia first half against Arkansas, and you kind of hope for that, well, the truth of the matter is, Georgia started a, a freshman who had never played a college football mm-hmm. game. He didn't look good, and they ended up going to a walk-on who basically just kind of played the role of game manager for the for the rest of it. And 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 you're obviously not getting that with Justin Fields in Ohio State. So <laughs> no, you're that's not. The, that's the unfortunate thing is that as many teams as there have been that have looked you know sluggish and rusty and whatever in their first game, the ones that that we kind of expected to have the best offenses were not among them. You're right. They are coming back loaded up. So it is going to be uh, an amazingly difficult task for 
the Nebraska defense, and, and we'll see if it can be a, be a shootout. I want to go to Clemson here, and as we look at this weekend here, where are you at with Miami? I mean, they've got a quarterback for the first time in a while. Uh, Miami seems to be doing okay. There's there's a, a smaller number next to their name. We've seen this movie before. Is it a is it a more competitive contest, or is Clemson just going to do Clemson things this weekend? I, I think Clemson's probably going to do Clemson things because this is the first time in maybe four years. Um, it's at least three that there's been a conference game that people have actually circled for Clemson and said, you know what, they could get a test here. Mm. And and I I think it's an opportunity for Clemson to, instead of just, you know, be the game that everyone else has circled, they can circle one themselves and say, okay, this is, this is a chance for us to, you know, to, to, to stand up and show what we got and maybe to, you know, make fools out of the people who this week are going to say they think Miami has a chance and all that stuff. And so uh, to, to have a motivated Clemson team in a conference game, it just, it just feels like a bad spot for Miami. And I think some people may have been uh, a little bit encouraged by what they saw from Virginia last week, being able to move the ball at times against Clemson and figure, hey, you know what, Miami's got a better offense than, than Virginia does. So maybe they can do it. I, I, I think if there are two things that would give Miami a chance of hanging in there, one is that they have – a quarterback who has great mobility and that Clemson is going to, they're going to get through the line of scrimmage and they're going to get pressure on everyone's quarterback who they face. And if you've got a guy who's capable of dodging some of that pressure and then making something out of nothing, um, it's going to give you a chance to create some points where most teams wouldn't have gotten any against Clemson. And then on the other side, if, if Miami does have a strength defensively, I would say that it's probably their pass rush and, Maybe if you can get some pressure on Trevor Lawrence, you could get their passing game uh, off schedule. And uh, the, the unfortunate thing for Miami is that, you know, when you get these situations and you, you, you go to the blueprint of how do you pull a big upset, it always starts with talking about, you know, winning the turnover battle. And, and Miami has been great at forcing turnovers. Like the, the turnover chain thing isn't all hype. They actually have the third most turnovers forced in the FBS since the turnover chain began in 2017. The problem is Trevor Lawrence hasn't thrown an interception in about a year. Okay. And their first team offense hasn't turned the ball over this season. So you figure, you know, Miami's best case is they might be able to force two turnovers more than likely one would be an accomplishment. And so they're going to have to earn it elsewhere. And that's just, it's not going to be easy to do. Brad, I saw an article which compared this Miami Clemson game uh, to the Louisville Clemson game when Lamar Jackson was still quarterback at Louisville. Louisville fell just short at the end, but they gave him a real test, maybe the last real test that they've faced in the regular season. Uh, Do you think that Miami could do something similar uh, just to what Louisville was able to accomplish in giving Clemson at least a scare? I think people are latching on to that game because of what Lamar Jackson was able to do as far as the dual threat, and they look at De'Ara King and they, they... see that the game that I would compare it more to would be when Clemson went to Louisville the following year Uh, I was there at that game and it was one that that because of what had happened the previous year everyone said oh yeah this is going to be a good game this is going to be a test for Clemson and and this is this is like I was saying earlier they have Clemson's attention okay (laughs) and that's not always a good thing Clemson wiped Louisville off the field Lamar Jackson's last year Um, and so as, as much as I, I, I Dara King is good enough to be in a game like this and to hold his own. My question is, does he have enough offensive teammates who are, and does he have enough defensive teammates who are? Brad, a, a quick thought here. Got a couple of minutes. How big a weekend is it for Jimbo Fisher? Florida comes to town. Yeah, I think it's big for proving that his program is on the right track. I don't think it's big for his job because you know, he's got all that guaranteed right. money. He's not going anywhere. But um, if, you know, when, when he first came in and everybody expected that, okay, he's going he's gonna to get them in contention in the SEC West, obviously that starts with being competitive against Alabama. Uh, you're, you're not going to beat Alabama very often when Saban's there, but if you can at least be competitive with, like what Georgia's done under Kirby Smart, I mean, they have taken Alabama to the wire twice, and they'll get Alabama again next week, and we'll see how they do with that one. 
But Georgia has shown on the field that there is not much of a difference between them and Alabama. A&M has not come close to that under Jimbo Fisher. Yeah. So this is a chance to show that, okay, maybe we're not at Alabama's level, but a team that's a notch down from Alabama talent-wise. And look, based on recruiting rankings, you could make the argument that A&M should have more talent than Florida does. So this is a, a, a much fairer fight. And uh, if they – if they, well, first of all, if they lose, their fans are going to be upset. But especially if it's not close, there are going to be a lot of people just kind of uh, selling their Jimbo Fisher stock, I guess would be the best way to put it. Bill O'Brien, does he end up back in college? About 30 seconds. I, I don't know. I, I don't know him well enough to know how important it would be for him to, you know, to, to prove himself in the NFL or whether he's had enough and, and uh, would rather go back. You know, I mean, that, that's what happened with Saban. Mm-hmm. And not that Saban got run out of Miami, but, but Saban coached in the NFL just a little bit, and he recognized he, he was a better fit for college, and he went back and he stayed. Uh, how does Bill, Bill O'Brien feel, college NFL? I have no idea. It'll be interesting to see if someone comes calling. He did incredible work at Penn State and left a pretty full cupboard for uh, uh, for James Franklin, and James has been awesome, of course, there. Brad, great to get caught up, man. Missed talking to you. Thanks for a few minutes today. All right. Thank you, guys. Take, Take care. care. Early to rise with Hale Varsity Radio. The voice of Husker Nation. Here's Chris Schmidt and Mark Cranick. One final time this hour, weekend edition, Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranick, Elijah Herbal. Brandon Vogel's coming up in 10 minutes. Good to talk with Vogue. Some college football on his mind. The Iron Horse is Gary Sharp at 8.30. We'll talk to Sharpie and uh, get into some more Husker football thoughts is uh, two weeks away from Nebraska and Ohio State. So, Cranach, uh, John Canzano writes uh, out in Oregon, pretty locked in college football guy. Does that Heard shock? a lot about him when Riley got hired. Right, yeah. because Riley would do quite a bit of uh, one-on-ones with him just from their past relationship. But Canzano put out a piece either late yesterday or it's on Twitter this morning that <laughs> – the old Pac-12 wasn't wanted, man. <laughs> I laugh, but it's – think about that. A Power 5 league that was having trouble finding a TV partner in Through today's day and age. Right. Through the pandemic. It's, it's shocking. I, <laughs> I, look, we know that people on the West Coast generally are more outdoorsy or hippie types. They have lots of things and options to choose. Yeah, and they normally don't choose college football. A few exceptions, Oregon. And if if, SC's killing it. If SC, right, right. If SC's killing it, uh, Utah, you know, Washington. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's some, uh, there's some, some exceptions. Arizona State because it's just the great prelude to a huge Coke party. Did I say that? (laughs) That's, I mean, really, that's. That's how they roll. That's a how the pack huge rolls. Coke party for a thousand. I mean, Alex. that's, you know, seems to be what a lot of those. You've been down in that area. Uh, um, Arizona State's Tempe's fun, man. But well, that's not my cup of snort, though. <laughs> I was just going to say, did you just make it an admission here? No, not at all. No, you did not. Uh, but yeah, they couldn't find it. Nobody wanted to <laughs> partner. None of the ABC, mm-hmm. Fox, like nobody. We'll, uh, we'll find uh, Brandon Vogel's thoughts on this and the Big Red 2020 next hour. The Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28 and now roll time. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Thanks for hanging out. Hour two, weekend edition. Hail Bar City Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, Elijah Herbal producing. Give us a follow on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio at Mark Skurs for Mark Cranach and at Herbal Essence for Elijah, we welcome in managing editor with HailVarsity.com and magazine, Brandon L. Vogel. At Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter, 
and you, you read his fantastic coverage of Nebraska and, uh, of course, his biography with John Cook. Dream Like a Champion, get a copy of that today. We say hi to Vogues. Vogues, uh, we'll start off with the traditional barbecue question. A lot of football to watch today before we dive into Nebraska football 2020. What is on the grill or smoker for you with all these games to check out today? <laughs> Nothing on the smoker uh, scheduled for today. Might do some wings, um, but Good that answer. looks like based on the uh, forecast for rain, looks like it'll be mostly an indoor procedure. So um, that's, that's kind of what I got. Okay. Now, when we do wings, are you going to oven or air fry or uh, the bunny just got that ninja super duper air fryer slash indoor grill deal. So we need to try that out once it gets cold. But how are you going to fire the wings up indoors? Yeah, I'll use the uh, convection bake mode on the oven, which Mm -hmm. I found works works pretty well. Um, So it's, you know, a little bit similar to you to air fryers uh and that it just gives you a little bit of uh extra crispiness so we'll go that route love it let's get into quarterbacks i know we got the food questions answered uh how uh intrigued what did you glean from from adrian what did you what did you glean from mccaffrey this week um, you know, I think the most interesting thing about that was probably just the the, the setting of, of seeing Luke McCaffrey in a in a press conference setting. You know, I know we've had the opportunity to to talk to him last year as a true freshman at, at times, um, but it just it's a lot different uh, with a lot different of five five reporters talking to him in the rain at Maryland uh, after he played some wide receiver to putting your backup quarterback up there. Uh, in, in a preseason press conference in, in this kind of setting. And I thought he handled himself really well. Um, I still think that, uh, well, I'm going with what, what Matt Lubick said two weeks ago at Nebraska played now. Adrian's still the guy, but that, that press conference kind of made me feel, okay, uh, Luke McCaffrey, not surprising given what we know of his history and his family, uh, is a capable leader and, and a guy who if you had to go with him, I don't think at least I personally wouldn't have any reservations about that. Look, we've kind of been burned on conventional wisdom on who you thought would be quarterback a few times over the last decade or so. I think before Taylor Martinez was named starter, it was like, yeah, right. That guy's not going to be the starter, obviously. And then I think same even with Jebbia and Martinez until Martinez was actually named. You're like, this is Jebbia. Of course it's Jebbia. And then it wasn't. (laughs) We're not dealing with a situation like that, are we? Where like McCaffrey could actually be named the starter week one? I, I think the only difference is uh, the, the four games we were able to see McCaffrey play without uh, without burning his red shirt here. And in some ways, those games aren't very representative. It, I think it makes us feel like we know more about McCaffrey than we actually do. Um, you know, Jacob, way, way back in January or February, uh, did a breakdown of his – passing plays, which you could do in one piece because there was only there were only twelve of them. So I mean I, <laughs> there's still a big piece there. Like everyone can see the athleticism and, and we kind of do that coming in. But but you're right. I've thought of as you know, whenever quarterback comes up and it always comes up. I've thought of that two thousand ten year. I mean Martinez was just a guy on the team and you heard some some reports about, hey, he's pretty tough to handle in practice, but uh, until you saw him in that first game um, and, and they made the call, that one was a total shock. And I had even thought of Martinez and Jebbia, but that's that's another good one. That, that one you kind of at least theoretically made sense because one was uh, a quarterback Frost chose and one was not. Brandon Vogel's with us, salevarsity.com and magazine managing editor at Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter. You know, I thought Adrian was pretty matter of, of fact and just – reading too much into the old screen here but the, with the zoom call i anticipate really good response it sounds like that's what's gone on from adrian not only with preparation but health and and now the option and opportunity to have a really seasoned line in front of him have a, a running game behind him with mills at least that is very familiar it's not new and i guess the, the missing piece of this offense is what, what do we have at wide out 
uh, in that uh, in that that what do you have at your disposal that you trust, right? And you know you got Wandale, you know you have Cade Warner, and you know you've got Stoll, and you just don't know how far along some of the new guys are at wide receiver. What, what's your I know Adrian's first question was about gelling and, and chemistry with the the wide receiver group, but you know where where are you at with that? Just because of how it hampered Adrian last year, I don't think he got helped out a lot, if at all, by his wide receivers many times last season. No, I don't. I don't think so either. And you know, if there's a a potential. Uh, caution flag for for Nebraska's offense in 2020. For me, it is that passing game. Uh, For some of the reasons you mentioned, um, how much work were they able to put in kind of, you know, quarterback and receiver together when the team itself wasn't able to be together? You know, continuity in the passing game is is like is the key factor. It's when you when we look at these returning production figures, um, the one you want is, is a ton of receiving yards returning. And, and Nebraska was in a pretty good spot with J.D. Spielman. He left, and then they were in a worse spot, which also tells you something about just how how limited Nebraska was on the receiving front, that one guy um, could could be such a big chunk. So, yeah, on paper it looked good with, with Spielman in the mix, but it was still – you were it was basically him and Robinson and, and then a little bit from the tight ends. No other wide receiver that – that's on the roster now had more than eight catches last year. Uh, and then, and that's, that's still the case, obviously. So, so that's a reason for concern. Um, I think Nebraska tries to get around that uh, a little bit. Well, maybe, maybe the chemistry is fine. We haven't seen them yet. All we've gotten are, are clips from practice, but I think Nebraska, I expect Nebraska to lead on that run game. You know, the, the praise for the offensive line almost across the board from the, the offensive coaches has, has been high. Uh, and I think that's a, a high ceiling group. Uh, I think the running backs are a high ceiling group, though young, behind Mills. But if Nebraska's going to make some hay um, this season, I think it comes on the ground. Brandon Vogel is with us on Hale Varsity Radio. Flip to the other side of the ball, and really, if you look at the entire team, you know you had a nice breakdown of, of Frost on uh, his monthly radio show, breaking down the position groups and categorized it as to like what he said about each group. He was, he was pretty positive on just about all of them. You know, some more so than others, of course, except for outside linebacker. Like he had no problem <laughs> just saying, well, we were garbage there last year and we need to get better paraphrasing. Of course. Um, one, what's your takeaway about him singling out that position? And then two, what do you expect out of that position? It's always a little bit of a surprise for for a coach to be that blunt about a a, a specific group, uh, and then you know, Jay Foreman joined Derek Peterson on on the Varsity Club podcast this week to to look at defense along with Greg Smith, and and, and Jay of course knows a thing or two about about linebacker play, and he he said he put it as Nebraska has gotten zero production for two years from that spot, and you look at it and it's, it's kind of true. Um, so Nebraska's got. Well, th- three guys that, that played quite a bit last year in, in, in Dome and Tanner and, and Nelson. Um, it's it's a pretty high stakes year, I think, for uh, Doman and, and, and Tanner. It, the, the time is kind of now to to show some steps, and, and we've seen Doman do some things in flashes. Nelson's an interesting one to me. Um, to be able to play as much as he did as a true freshman indicates, I guess at least something about his willingness to, to, to learn that spot and, and to try and get it right. Does he look like a sophomore? I think is, is kind of the key question there for him. And, and I think he probably will. Uh, the guy's got a really great work ethic. Beyond that, you're looking at some, some junior college additions, most likely. Um, we'll see if one of the young guys, uh, a true freshman or a redshirt freshman, can, can pop up. But it's, it's a spot where it, you need some – it's, it's, a, it's a tough spot in today's game. It's, it's a tough position to play. And Nebraska's still looking for that, I guess, perfect fit. Uh, the guy that has the ability to to stay on the field almost no matter what happens. Uh, so we'll see if they get there this year. I, do, I just want to jump in here real quick, too. I, I'm, I don't know. It, is, is, is that position almost – I don't know. Are you looking for, like, the perfect player 
there? Is it fair for us to say, hey, Nebraska, hey, Chenander, hey, Frost, like you're very few of those human beings exist that can play that position. We might want to try something different. Or, or is it just like, no, 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 you, you can re- absolutely recruit to that position and have guys because you're basically asking for players that, like, like you said, never come off the field that can cover downfield tight ends or receivers that can also rush the passer and take on offensive tackles and help it. Like you're looking for just the perfect player. Does that can Nebraska like get those guys? Do those guys walk around or are they all sort of at Alabama or Clemson and that's it? Yeah, it's it, it's tough, and it's it's a little bit similar to me uh, to elite defensive linemen. There aren't a ton of those ready-made guys, um, and, and the competition to get them is pretty fierce. <laughs> a lot of them end up being in the Southeast, and, and a lot of them stay in the Southeast to go to college. Um, I think that's one of the differences between the SEC and everybody else uh, is just th- that sort of athleticism on the defensive side of the ball. So, so that's a fair question. It, it's tough. I mean, Caleb Tanner, it's part of why, I mean, he was a four-star prospect, obviously, but also from Georgia. So guys like that don't leave Georgia very often. He's the guy who kind of looks the part. Um, It's why I think Nelson is going to be a pretty interesting test case for Nebraska um, because he comes from a place that I'm very familiar with, uh, Scott's Bluff, which doesn't send a ton of players. players to Nebraska, much less the FBS level in general. Um, but you just don't see that very often from, you know, that, that far out West in, in Nebraska. Uh, so, so that'll be interesting. I think he'll be a, a case of, well, his own work ethic, which I feel is strong, but also the coaching. Uh, it was kind of interesting during Frost's radio appearance. Uh, you, you got the sense that he was really encouraged uh, about having Mike Dawson back. Uh, and about having working with that work, work with that group. Uh, so we'll see what it produces. Brandon Vogel's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Brandon, one of the things that concerns me, and I think a lot of people, about the outside linebacker position is that it's got to be Doman, Garrett Nelson, and Caleb Tanner playing a lot of snaps. And, and that's kind of what was echoed in the press conference. Uh, but in a season like this, where you're in the middle of a pandemic and you're playing eight games against conference teams, no bye weeks, uh, what concerns me is, is depth. Uh, because if you have a COVID-19 positive test that's 21 days you got to be out or playing all those big 10 games you get an injury you're gonna have to sit out for a little bit are there any other positions on the team where you're concerned about depth potentially being an issue this season i think i think that might be the the primary one you may have just hit it elijah because uh, you look at inside linebacker and you can easily kind of rattle off well four names for sure maybe even five uh, you, you almost wonder with inside linebackers in terms of divvying up those snaps if, if there's a guy on that outside looking in. Um, and, and maybe that can help you at, at outside linebacker. Um, I, I still think wide receiver it, it is pretty shallow. Um, Nebraska has done its best to to shore that up over, well, really since they, they got here, that this staff got here in 2018, but it's, it's definitely a work in progress. And if you lose, you know, even one, kind of key guy there you get down uh down deeper in the depth chart than you'd like to pretty fast so those might be the top two vogues uh, last thought on, on outside banker how big a blow is it to have a dinged up buddha right i mean what was the level of of expectation for him to be another name an outside backer and i know because of the athleticism and some some weight loss you got Feldarius Payne, and then look, man, he's 6'6", 240, or whatever he's at. They're, they're looking at him. Is that – how do you view that? Is it, oh, man, they need more bodies because of this depth conversation? Or, okay, this guy could be a fit because of his athleticism. What's the scale tilt in, in your view when you look at that? Yeah, I think I think both of those guys. Well, they're not exactly the same for me. I, I think Wright getting a look there um, is an encouraging sign, mm-hmm. uh, and not a sign of, of panic or distress. Um, it just says to me, like, hey, this guy's kind of got a nose for a football. He's super athletic. He can do a lot of things, and, and we think he has the frame um, for us to kind of build him to this spot. Payne, you know, is is one who I, I wasn't surprised to hear he was he was working some out there. Um, he 
I think that's a better fit for him, honestly. Um, so, so both of those I, or, or moves that, that made some sense to me. Um, but, you know, to, to Elijah's point, yeah, they need some, some additional options there. Um, Blaze Gunnarsson is, is a guy whose name hasn't come up very often um, as, as a true freshman. But <clears throat> what's, what's, he, what's he capable of? You know, it's, it's just tough without the regular run-up to a season to know what, what some of these new additions, be, be it true freshman or a junior college player even, are going to be capable of doing. Um, it, everything's a little bit off kilter. Brandon Vogel with us on Hale Varsity Radio. Um, we were talking in the first hour, Brandon, about like just position groups that we are most optimistic about. And Chris rattled off offensive line as probably his number one. Um, my number one is secondary. What's yours? Uh, probably, pro- I would probably go offensive line, but those are my two my two picks. It's really one and one A for me. Um, I, I I might give the O line the edge, um, just because <clears throat> with the addition with with a player like Brant Banks or um, Bryce Binhart really pushing for some some roles here uh, with all of the experience Nebraska had returning, I think tells. Well, it tells me that the, the competition level should be pretty high there, and, and that's always good. Now, I think the, the competition level has the chance to be pretty high in the secondary, too. Um, Frost mentioned this week that with the loss of Braxton Clark, which, which is unfortunate, I was excited to see him play. Uh, Cam Taylor Britt basically moves out to that, that cornerback spot. Which is good. Cam Taylor played. Britt's a really good football player, uh, but they've got this kind of second wave of guys—guys guys who are redshirt freshmen, freshmen, or, or sophomores—that I'm really intrigued to see. Um, we just haven't seen them kind of crack that. You know, none of them are beating out Markel Dismuke at this point or DiCaprio Boodle. Uh, doesn't mean that that can't happen. It's just the, those starters there in the secondary feel a little bit more set in stone, at least for now. Um, but but I really like that the secondary group as a whole, and and I think that's I think that's super important for Nebraska. You know, we were talking a couple minutes ago about the difficulties in, in finding defensive linemen and, and outside linebackers. One thing Nebraska has consistently been able been able to to do recruiting wise over the course of its history, and maybe most evidently during the Bo Pelini era, is is get elite defensive backs or or find elite defensive backs and and build them into that. So. I'm pretty encouraged with where Nebraska's at in the secondary. Brandon, what's your level of optimism for the special teams with a few new pieces coming in, as well as Jonathan Rutledge coming in as a new analyst to, uh, to coach him up? <laughs> um, uh, they can't be much worse. So I guess my optimism level is medium high. Like it, 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 it's hard without having seen many of those guys, particularly in the kicking game, um, without having seen them. I, I would expect Nebraska to kind of get back closer to at least average. Um, if, if anything more than that feels a little bit like, like icing on the cake for this year, but you look at the coverage part of it. I think the, the staff, well, they said it specifically um, and, and who knows if this is just kind of camp chatter. Uh, we'll see, but one of the ways you can really determine how deep a team is, is is who's playing on special teams and how good are they? Um, and, and I think Nebraska has a chance to upgrade um, just with some of the bodies that they'll have available, um, guys who maybe are fourth, fifth in, in those linebacker races but can become special teams aces. Um, I think Nebraska has a pretty positive outlook on that. I just don't know what their ceiling is on special teams yet. Vogues, we'll say goodbye uh, your game of the weekend. Who you who you tuning in for today? Oh, man, there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting ones. I'm pretty interested in that old Miss-Alabama game. I mean, yeah. I think Alabama will eventually uh, <laughs> do what Alabama does, but the Lane Kiffin angle is certainly interesting. Uh, and then Texas a and Florida uh, is going to be pretty intriguing, too, just with where, how things have gone so far for A&M. So those will probably be the two that I'm paying the most attention to. Well, we'll have that uh, imaginary corn dog at the Texas State Fair, all right, since uh, you can't get it this year. Brandon Vogel, managing editor, Hale Varsity. Vogues, have a good weekend. Thanks for jumping on. You too, guys. Thanks a lot. There he is, Brandon Vogel at Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter. Hey, um, you want – okay, random trivia question here for you. 
Do it. How many how many running backs does Nebraska carry on its roster? Fourteen. Yes. How did you know that? Did you look that up recently? I have not made a move towards the computer in thirty minutes, have I, Elijah? No, yes. And that was a shockingly good guess, actually. I was I was thinking <laughs> somewhere in like the 14. ten range. Fourteen. Yeah, it's literally fourteen. There are fourteen running. I now, find that from a scholarship standpoint, do they have what? Eleven of the fourteen? Nine of the fourteen? Nine of the fourteen are, are what walk ons? You said? No, I'm saying scholarship. Oh, scholarship! You got, you got Ramir, Marvin, Ronald, Diedrich, Sevian. Yeah, you got five of them that are on. Okay. Yes, yeah, so you got nine walk. But I'm just thinking about that. Like, usually you have one running back playing at a time. Like, imagine being the 14th string guy. Dude, like, you're, you're not getting, third string. You're getting you're carries. Not, you're getting carries in practice. You're not fourth. You're not even eighth string. Ty Robinson may be pile driving you, but, you know, you're, you're getting a carry. 14th string. That would just be tough to take. I'd put that in my Twitter bio. If I was the 14th string running back in Nebraska, <laughs> that's going right, in tw- tw- right to Twitter and right to Tinder. <laughs> but that tells you. We'll let you handle that, the order. <laughs> that tells me, though, they're, they're, they like to work on the run game in practice. And they need, some, uh, they need some bodies. We'll uh, talk to the Iron Horse. Gary Sharp coming up next. It's the weekend edition of Hail Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Glad to have you back. Yes, sir. You heard me right. Here are the guys, Schmidt and Cranach. Well, Hector, here's the game plan. You're going to bring us two absolute martinis. You know how I like them straight up. And then precisely seven and one half minutes after that, you're going to bring us two more. And then two more after that every five minutes until one of us passes out. Excellent strategy, sir. No passing out yet this morning on the weekend edition of Hale Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, we... Welcome in the Iron Horse, two weeks from Nebraska, Ohio State, and he's still smiling about his Miami Heat. Sharpie, did you get home in time from uh, TV work to uh, to catch Jimmy do his thing? Yeah, so I got in the car, and uh, they were up six, and I thought, wow, I'm bad luck, so <laughs> I turned off the uh, radio, got home, turned it back on, and they were, they were up to uh, nine, so that was quite the performance. I was... Uh, not surprised that the Heat gave him a game, but uh, you never know. But, gosh, if we could all be on the same level as Jimmy Butler when it comes to competing or that whole mindset, my gosh, we'd, we'd be exhausted after. Imagine doing this show for two hours every Saturday with Jimmy Butler energy. You'd be exhausted. Your weekend would be over. We, we aspire to have energy like imagine? Jimmy. Yeah, what do you mean imagine? That's what we, we leave it all on the mic every single Saturday. Leave it all on the table. There's there's coach speak and then there's radio speak. Well done. <laughs> yeah, nicely nicely played, Mr. Kradak. All right, Sharpie, if you're a betting man, where will Nebraska's pass rush come from in 2020? Will it be the defensive end or the outside linebacker spot? Um, what if I went with a push and said both, but Ooh. won't be up to won't be up to the standards that you have to have to be really successful in the Big Ten. Okay, so both will give it, but it won't be enough is what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I think those are, you know, you look at outside linebacker and you look at who's going to play uh, outside of defensive end, there's still questions. Um, you know, we kind of forget about Ben Stilley. I, I think guys in the Nebraska program that are going on like the third year as a starter, we tend to forget about them, even though they've had quality careers and still he started 14 games. I just think there's a lot of unknown. That doesn't mean that they're, they're, they cannot create a pass rush and be better than we thought. I just think we haven't seen anything, and there's some guys learning new positions, and there's some guys that are going to be welcome to Division One football playing Ohio State that we don't know. But Mark and I, I think earlier in the summer, Schmitty, you were away, Mark and I were talking about a defensive line. Uh, they look like a Big Ten defensive line. I think they're starting to get a very good idea of what the outside linebacker position can do in this defense, what they should look like, their ability to cover uh, the run, but also play in space. I, I think this group, um, in particular, defensive ends and outside linebackers, are about a year away. But there's a lot of promise there. I mean, I know people have bought multiple tickets on the Ty Robinson hype train hoping that he stays healthy and he plays up to everything we thought when he came to Nebraska. Because if he does, then I think some other things fall in place at those positions. You know, Brandon was just talking last segment, too, about uh, special teams. 
and just saying, yeah, just, just get them back up to average. I mean, it's it's pretty rare that you'll have a you'll have a position group that is just a straight up liability. Let alone, you know, you get average play out of them. Or, I mean, the special teams was an absolute. It was a minus. It was a liability. It just it t- took away from the success of the team. If you could think back, imagine Nebraska had just average, middle of the road, run of the mill special teams play last year. Does that affect their record? Are they? Do, does Nebraska get more wins and end up in a bowl last year just off of that alone? Yeah, I think there's two games late in the season up for you, Wisconsin and Iowa. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. You, you think about you think about both of those games after Nebraska either gained momentum or really had a good feel about where they were in the game, and it was a very winnable game. What happened? Yeah. You turn around and you watch two guys on those respective teams running down the field with a kickoff to score a touchdown. And what happened is after that, you were deflated. And that team was too fragile at that point in the season uh, mentally that they couldn't afford those things to happen. I think, I think what has happened, and I, and I continue to say this, that I, I, Scott Frost did a good job in season last year and after the season of evaluating where his program is and what has to be fixed. I think he has fixed the internal stuff I think then he went the next step and said, why aren't we achieving better play on the field? Why aren't we a smarter football team? What ails us? And I think he then started to look at his staff, himself, fix those kind of things. And in particular in special teams, that's that's the thing that is mind-boggling the first two years is the attention to detail and the little things that seem to be so hard for Nebraska to accomplish. And they are magnified on special teams when one guy could just be a little bit out of his lane or try and play hero ball, and, and the next thing you know, the guy's running past you and he's going the length of the field for a touchdown on a kickoff return. So I, I think in his hires of, in the offseason, whether it be Mike Dawson, Matt Lubick, or bringing in Jonathan Rutledge to, to oversee special teams, I think they – have three guys in those positions where last year the details were lacking. Um, they fixed those, and now we'll see the result. But I think with special teams, that's going to be a worry I think across the board we see in college football. But I, I, I think at Nebraska initially, because you have a bunch of new faces in key positions, whether they be holders, snappers, kickers, punters, or people that are playing on your coverage teams or your protection teams. Um, but you got enough depth now, so maybe that will help ease some of the concerns that uh, has ailed Nebraska the first two years. Gary Sharp's with us, the Iron Horse, Hale Varsity Radio Weekend Edition. Sharpie, put your OC headset on. It can be a 90s throwback headset or it can be a 2020 version. And uh, how would Gary Sharp use McCaffrey on offense this year? I would use him where he is best. And either that is a a decoy. Now we're assuming that he's not going to win the job, correct? Yeah, let's just go okay. forward. Like, okay, Adrian's going to going to do his I, thing, I, and, and and he's now it's up to getting him snapped somehow. I think you have to approach it and look at Luke McCaffrey and go, man, we have a special athlete here that can not only step in and be the starting quarterback in Nebraska, but also can catch the ball, can run the ball. If you're going to commit to Adrian is your starter, but you want Luke on the field because the whole end goal is to win games. Luke McCaffrey can help you win games. Then whatever package you put together for him week by week, you have to follow through with that. You can't just use him as a little gimmick or a decoy. You have to use him as a real part of your offense if that's what you're committed to. And I would put him in situations where Luke can run the ball. He can, you know, you could play, you could bring Luke McCaffrey in. And he could do wildcat. Um, you know, you could split him out, and he could catch the ball. We've seen all of that. But I think if you're going to go there, you got to commit to it. And when you put him in, you utilize him, not just put him in to be a decoy. But think about it. You could get real crazy. And I, I, think, I think Nebraska might be in this situation because you had a lot of downtime during the quarantine that you looked at your all-22, and maybe you have looked at other teams' all-22 and stolen ideas. Nebraska could put three quarterbacks – on the field at the same time. They could have Adrian Martinez, Luke McCaffrey, and Alante Brown all out there. Hmm. Nice. Maybe maybe bring over some Cam Taylor Britt. 
I mean, then you just have four guys playing catch that on the field. It'll be great. <laughs> it'll be it'll be something we've never seen before. You line all four up, and then you ask, and then you ask uh, Cam Jurgens, expert snapper, to just, <laughs> you know, you don't know who he's going to even snap it to. By the I way, think... I'm just thinking about that. Could have been a great way to hedge against his wild snaps last year. You put two or three <laughs> quarterbacks back there. He's going to hit one of them close. <laughs> Done, uh, done. Mark, Mark will be here till the top of the hour. Well, Crane, get some more, uh, some more wild turkey, brother. I mean, that hey, was am good. I, am, I, am, I, am I crazy, guys, to think listening to uh, Scott the other night and then Mario uh, from Weekend at Bernie's the other day? That was money. That, that <laughs> when they talk about both of the quarterbacks, and I truly believe it's a competition, and I truly believe that Adrian is being pushed by Luke McCaffrey, that they are very, and we'll find out more after today's scrimmage, but they are very careful not to talk more about one over the other. If you mention Adrian, you almost immediately mention Luke or vice versa. And am I reading that wrong, or did you guys sense that this week as well? No, they were both talked about, and they're both in the spotlight to, to compete for that job. It's a, it's a real thing. It is not lip service about the job being open, and that's, that's just a message to Adrian, and he was – pretty upfront about his preparation tweaks, right, you know, going into this year uh, with uh, just managing re- really that, that one game at a time, not looking too far back, not looking uh, too far ahead, but living in the moment. That's one of the comments Adrian said that, that stuck out with me, but the the, the part of, of McCaffrey and Adrian mentioned together, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a real thing. It's It's – not just uh, let's just pay it some words and some attention, so we don't lose one of them, right? I mean, just just be, and I'm not saying that that's been a thought. I'm not insinuating that at all. I'm just saying you have a very real uh, situation in the world of college football when you look around with with quarterback transfers, right, Gary? Yeah, and I and you know, and it's uh, kind of a an, a weird situation because everybody gets a free year of eligibility. <laughs> yeah. You know, Adrian Martinez, he wins the job, stays healthy all year, plays every game. He can come back next year and play again. And you know what? He can come back and play the year after that. So it's, it's, you got to balance it. Um, but I think, I, I, I don't know, and, and, and Mark, you, you know, you, you, we've talked a lot about quarterbacks. I think if you're Nebraska, whether you be a coach or a fan, this is the most comfortable you felt with your quarterback room in a long, long time. Most people feel good with their one. But when you look at their number two, you're like, eh, okay, it pressed into service. I think this is the first time in a long time that you look at both quarterbacks and go, you know what, regardless of who's playing, nothing's going to change. When the backup guy comes in, we don't have to tear up the playbook and get really vanilla. We can still run the same offense. I don't think I've said that in a while. It has been a long time. I'm, I'm trying to think of, like, like when, when did you have a really solid one and two that you would feel good about? And look, McCaffrey still has something to prove. He hasn't played a lot, yeah. um, but and it's, seen and it's, much, and it's, it's much and it's much different when you're the guy instead of the guy that just comes in and then bounces back out. But considering his bloodlines and what we've seen, yeah, I, you know, there's there's obvious reason for optimism. Yeah. Um, no, like really, like, I'm trying to think. Like, when was the last time on the roster? <laughs> this I, I hate to go here, but you got to go back to '95. Oh my God! Do you and then have to go back that far? Does it? I, I'm not saying it. Well, it might, but you know, ooh. even even Eric with uh, Jamal as his backup, you okay. didn't really know much about Jamal because he, you know, he was still I mean, kind of relatively new in the program. I mean, are we are we talking the Cody Green era? Well, or do you or do you go back to Newcomb and Crouch? Because well, even no. Cody Green, you didn't that necessarily feel battle? good about I, everybody. It depends who you, you know ask. <laughs> yeah, no, no, and then and then I'll throw another one in here, and, and and he still hasn't played it down a football, and he you know it's only been here since the calendar flipped to twenty twenty. You want to add Logan Smothers into the mix? You you feel good in that quarterback room, and I tell you, they also really like Matt Masker mm-hmm. from Carney. They think he's made some great strides. Now is he going to hop over two guys and get in the mix? Not likely, but he has made some strides. So I think they feel real good about that quarterback room. And we know 
Adrian Martinez, in two years as a starter, hasn't been able to finish the whole year. So I pose this question to you. Both of you guys can answer this. There is no wrong or right answer. The person that starts two weeks from today, is that the same person that starts on December 12th against Minnesota? Yes. And I'll say that you may have an injury. You may see whoever the number two quarterback is see time. Uh, but I think who, who starts the year will finish the year. But I can't guarantee that it'll be all straight eight starts by who wins the job. Does that make sense? I think you can see you can see an injury where someone's got a you know think of the Minnesota game last year, right? Where the Pride of Wahoo got the start up there, uh, and you had Adrian recovering, so. I think who wins the job will will finish the year unless it's one of those season enders. That that's how I view it. How you view it, Mark? I, you know, you bring up a good good point. I think it's going to be it's such a condensed. We don't know, schedule. man. <laughs> it's such a condensed schedule, though. That I and they haven't played in so long that I could see I could see injuries really playing a role here more so than maybe past years. Just because it's so condensed, there's no rest. Everything's physical. Yeah, no, I would say no. I don't think that does happen. I, I'd, I'd be surprised if uh, if your quarterback, especially in a run-heavy offense, where you ask your quarterback to run, I, I just no. I, I don't think I don't think it'll be Adrian by then. Well, I think you can ask him to run, and he he has played better when he's been allowed to run. But you just can't have that fear of, of injury. Easier to say than well, do, you know. Well, but but the other thing, and you, you guys are absolutely right on Adrian. But also remember, he will take the field two weeks from today, and that is as healthy as he's been since he's been in Nebraska, since he took the field against Colorado in his first game. And remember, he got injured in that game. Yep. Yeah, he got WWE in that game, you know. Sharpie, I want to get your take on Omar Manning. What, what's your read on the situation there? Well, I think there's something there. Um, you know, it's – uh, the transition from junior college football to big time Division One college football, where they're going to demand a little bit more out of you, possibly, you know, well, not possibly, accountability on and off the field. Um, for some, that's not an easy transition. For others, that's what they need. I think it's been a, a rocky transition for Omar uh, in terms of being able to get on the field where, you know, they're going to they're going to put a physical toll on your body that you haven't experienced for a while. So you might have a nagging injury or two, and you get frustrated that you cannot perform like you have. Um, but you have to, you know, they're, they're relying on him. He's got to take care of business. But I, there's something there. I, I think, you know, maybe when Scott has media availability possibly this upcoming week, that's a follow-up question. Um, you know, he kind of he, he, he said, he said the right thing the other night when the caller into his show asked about him. Uh, Adrian Martinez was asked about him the other day and kind of, skirted the issue when you say but junior college players have to be good right away and he's not the guy meant he's not one of the guys mentioned even though he came in as the number one junior college wide receiver in the country i think it's something to follow and you know I, i'm i'm enamored by him i think that would be unfortunate if it couldn't work out but you know you're you're held to you're held to some standards that you have to follow through and sometimes it takes a little longer for some to to get you know, reach those standards, but I hope it works out. But that's a that's a storyline that's not going to go away until we actually see him play in a football game. And you know, it, it, he might not be there two weeks from today. Yeah, that'd be crazy. Um, Gary Sharp with us on Hale Varsity Radio. So, if that happens, and we don't know, maybe maybe he'll turn it on and be fine. Um, is it is it really like who, who's the guy? Who are the names that emerge that we just haven't seen? Like we know what we have in Wandale. We know what we have in Kurt or in. Uh, Kurt, sorry, and Cade Warner. That too. It's kind of it. It's kind of it in terms of like production on the field. Who who do you think just becomes a, a known name that produces? Well, Alante Brown. I mean, he's everybody's put stock in him. He, I've talked to people that have watched him in the last week, and he is the real deal. I mean, his speed and the way he's been able to pick up the offense, and he's like a sponge. He's always asking questions. Cade Warner's kind of taking him under his wing. Uh, he's someone to watch. Uh, I think then 
Where it, where it moves to is all of those key ingredients of the 2019 class, which really is the make it or break it for this program moving forward, that they get major contributions out of the majority of that class. And there's a couple of key wide receivers that are in that class. And Nance and Houston. And, you know, Houston didn't get on the field last year, but he looks completely different with his body and how fast he is compared to when he showed up on campus. So those guys have got to get on the field, and they've got to make an impact. But I think what we're going to see, depending on that wide receiver room, as they, they try and figure out their roles, and it opens the door for the transfer from South Dakota, who has had a good intake coming into the program. What it really does is it says to you, Wondell Robinson will be even more important this year. And all of this lip service to tight ends, it's real this year. But they're going to heavily involve the tight ends until the wide receivers get up to speed. Now, what does that say for the quarterback and trying to find his favorite targets? Well, you still have one on the field. You just need to find three or four other consistent wide receivers out there. And I think that'll be a, you know, that'll be a, a situation that'll be week to week as new guys come in and guys develop and guys get more confidence. But that's an area where it's a concern, but you feel like you're in a better spot than you were last year with the skill guys at wide receiver that you have. Sharpie, uh, do the Canes cover tonight? We'll get you out of here on that. Uh, I don't think so. Unless it's late, I don't think we'll hear the phrase is Miami back. How crazy is this, guys? This is uh, two weeks before the Big Ten. It's a pretty good slate. I mean, I, I like mm-hmm. the slates where every game seems to matter. We don't have you know these non-conference uh, cupcake games. We have real conference games. We're going into a football weekend, college football weekend, where Notre Dame and Florida State and Texas and Oklahoma – aren't even close to the top games in college football today. How wild is that? Man, they're, they're the all-name squads, but yeah, those games are kind of dogs. And that sucks to say because Texas OU is always one of my favorites. Uh, and Not no, me. no state favorite Not Texas. Uh, yeah, the stadium won't be packed. Uh, but, but boy, do both of those teams need to win. I think Tom Herman needs to win more than anybody else in the country today. I don't think you're wrong with that. Gary Sharp, the Iron Horse. Sharp, you have a good weekend, buddy. Thanks for jumping on with us. As always, guys, thank you. All right, there he is. That's Thanks, uh, the Iron Horse. So do you have a uh, uh, a new friend in, in, in the land of Cranach? You, did did you, you, could, could you hear him in the background? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, Tucker. <laughs> Tell me good, about, you, you said Tucker, right? Tucker. Yeah, yeah. Tucker, uh, Tucker, but you can't do that one. Yeah, no, uh, he's, yeah, he's great. He's he's uh the vet thinks he's half Sharpay, half Lab. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, he's got a, so he's a, he's got a few little wrinkles, but not really, not to the point where they're like folds, and you have to take a toothbrush in there and clean mm-hmm. out bacteria. Nothing like that. But he's got a couple little tiny folds. Well, but get, he's really low drama. Man. Get, get him not, his red jersey. I, you know, I could. He's kind of a gold. He's kind of he's a ginger. Nah. He's 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 a redhead. Um, <laughs> really low drama. He doesn't. I mean, he doesn't do it like I work from home. He just mm-hmm. lays there the whole time. He doesn't care. Um, then you take him out, and you, you know he wants to murder squirrels and who does make out with every dog and human that walks by. But I'd rather have that than have him be all vicious. No, I got you. Cranach, we'll get ready, man. Two weeks. Oh, it's coming. All right. Here we go. Back at you Monday for Hale Varsity. Thanks for tuning in.